So, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, everyone. Welcome in this roundtable P2 RT1 for session uh, 2.4. My name is Jonathan Barré. I'm a region client lead analyst um, in the IDC, and I'll be the convener for this uh, roundtable. I will be assisted today by my colleague Yolanta Kuzmiacic Michulek, who is taking care of the chat for this session. Uh, before we start, very quick reminder on the development of the of the session. So each participant uh, will have two minutes, and I insist on the two minutes, to promote and create uh, interest in his or her e-poster by presenting highlights of the work. Um, I will then go through the list that I just communicated to you before we started uh, streaming, one after the other, so please be ready to take the floor on a quite short notice. Uh, if you use or if you wish to use one or two slides, uh, please feel free to do so uh, and share them from your own computer uh, using the WebEx share uh, function. So additionally, uh, in addition actually to this roundtable, I would like to encourage you all to visit the e-posters available on the SNT 2021 uh, event platform. And I think it's all for the introduction. I would then suggest to give the floor to our first participant, uh, Mr. Theodoros Christoudias. So Theodoros, if you are with us, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you can see my screen. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to present a um, uh, scientific application of the uh, INS uh, datasets, compile them with a global model to obtain a constraint on the model performance and also to value impacts after the Fukushima accident. We used a global model at 50 kilometer resolution, uh, captured the whole period 1st of March to 31st May 2011, includes scavenging, driver position, sedimentation in our model. We have different emission inventories based on uh, compilation from uh, different sources uh, for uh, xenon, cesium, and iodine uh, radioisotopes. And then we compare the model, uh, simulated model um, uh, transport with the IMS uh, uh, station measurements. Uh, all along, uh, the model represents the measurements well, and then we are able to estimate the total deposited. Uh, radioactivity. So we have an estimate that 80% of the deposition happened over the uh, Pacific uh, Ocean. For uh, xenon, it's a noble guy, we see excellent agreement. For cesium, we have very good agreement considering the high uncertainties in modeling uh, uh, the aerosol phase. And for iodine, our model systematically underestimates the observations, but we do know the factor of high uncertainty in the source. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stilos, for this uh, nice introduction of your poster. Um, the next speaker will be Syed Mikaimer. I'm not sure he joined us already. So, Syed, if you are with us, good morning, and the floor is yours. Okay, looks like Syed didn't join us already. Uh, so I will then give the floor to the next speaker for the two minutes introduction. And the next speaker is my fellow countryman, actually, Peter de Meute. Good morning, Peter. Uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'll um, share my screen. So uh, I will. I have a poster about the following topic: How can we determine the origin of radionuclide observations uh, presenting the Bayesian source reconstruction algorithm here? This work was done at uh, Health Canada in collaboration with uh, SEK Sen and the RMI. Uh, so, given uh, radionuclide observations, airborne radionuclide observations, and their associated source receptor sensitivities. The FRARE tool allows to determine the source parameters, which is described on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, this algorithm is written in R. It can run on a laptop, and it is uh, available under the GNU public license uh, on, uh, on GitLab via the link uh, shown here. So we invite uh, users uh, or, or potential users to, to visit the website, download the code, and then start playing with it. Um, furthermore, on the poster, um, 
we highlight some uh, the work that was done to uh, take into account both detections and non-detections, and also how we can uh, take into account uh, model uncertainty coming from the atmospheric transport model. Um, so uh, to conclude, you can uh, find technical references uh, also in the poster. Uh, it is available on GitLab, and I would like to thank my um, uh, colleagues from Environment Canada and the GNE, and also I would like to refer to the poster by Ian, uh, which is uh, displayed here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this good introduction. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Christian Maurer from Austria. Good morning, Chris, uh, Christian. Sorry, the floor is yours for the two minutes introduction. Good morning. I have issues sharing my okay. screen, so this is not activated. I had these issues already <laughs> several times, so this sharing button does not work. So then I, I will just yeah, summarize uh, my work. Otherwise, Christian, I can go to the next speaker if you prefer, so that you can check before and then I come back to you right after. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do that. Thanks, Christian. Then I come back to you in two, three minutes. Mm -hmm. The next speaker on my list is Carlos Eduardo Bonfim from Brazil. Um, Carlos, if you are with us, good morning. And the floor is yours. Okay, I don't see Carlos, so um, I will come back to him a bit later. Uh, Christian, I will then leave still a little bit of time to you, and I will go to Andy Delclo from Belgium. Good morning, Andy. The floor is yours, and you are there. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I will also have a look at the magic chair token. That seems to work. So my presentation is about uh, simulating xenon concentrations at the MS Novogratz stations using operational stack emission data from the medical isotope production facility of Lourdes. To make it uh, short, uh, the goal here is that we will use uh, the stack emission data in order to use this in more or less near real time to have a good ID about the background of xenon in Europe. And therefore, we have been looking at uh, two stations, uh, RN33 and RN63. Uh, and the goal is uh, in the future to even uh, go towards uh, higher resolution meteorological data. For this research, we have been working with uh, data from the ECMWF uh, at uh, 0 0.5 degrees and 0 0.1 degrees. So I can give you some hints about the results. So in first, uh, the results were quite okay, especially for station 33. And uh, also good was that the high resolution data showed better results than uh, the coarser resolution. And uh, what we have been seeing, especially for station 63, is that Pretty clear that we need more uh, information there, and therefore it would be very beneficial if we could also include the emissions of uh, nuclear power plants in order to better uh, improve this uh, modeling. So this is more or less a short summary of uh, the work we are aiming. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andy, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, I will then now come back to Christian Maurer. Christian, are you ready to take over the floor? Yeah, but I just can give a summary, so it's not possible to share the screen. Okay, let's go ahead with the summary. Thank you. The floor is yours. 
Yeah, so in the work I'm presenting here, we investigated the, ad the added value of ensemble prediction system input data for Flexport for applications of the CTPTO. So as you all know, CTPTO to date runs operationally an ATM chain in backward mode based on operational uh, deterministic data. And here, as I said, we investigated the potential benefit of ensemble modeling for, for CTPTO applications based on ESIM WF EPS data. So five different test cases uh, were uh, investigated. You will find them listed in my presentation. You will learn which ESIM WF ensemble products were used depending on the date of the test case. Uh, you will learn uh, which data was gathered, so real and synthetic gathered, and how it was uh, processed, and how finally our transport model Flexport was set up for the purpose of this study. So what are the results? So the test cases run in backward mode. Um, here we here we, we, have, we put an emphasis on how reducing PSR fields in a meaningful manner via ensemble metrics. And for the test cases run in forward mode, the emphasis was put on explaining measured sample via ensemble concentration uh, ranges. And an important conclusion also in the context of a potential operational application is that an arbitrarily selected 10 member ensemble is sufficient in order to benefit to a large degree from desired ensemble properties. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for this introduction. Um, on my list, the next person, the next uh, speaker is Aliaksei Pazniaku. I'm not sure he's with us, so Aliaksei, if you are with us, the floor is yours. So it looks like Hali Aksay is not with us. Uh, the next speaker on my list is Alexander Hillen from Austria. Alexander, if you are with us, the floor is yours. Then I will jump directly on the next speaker who is Michael Fox. I don't see him on the list, so Michael, if you are with us, the floor is yours. No, or Petra Seibert, and I don't see Petra in the list. Oh, Aliaksei Pazniaku just join us. So Aliaksei, good morning. Uh, the floor is yours for the two minutes presentation. The floor is yours. Aliaksei, you are muted, so you should unmute yourself to start the presentation. Alexei, you are still muted and I cannot unmute you, so you need to do it. Okay, a request to unmute yourself has been sent, so please answer positively to that. Okay, we start seeing we start your presentation. So. Okay, now we see your presentation. Please now kindly put your presentation in the and I will unmute myself. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, well, 
uh, in our poster, uh, uh, we present a numerical model that we created uh, uh, to simulate a tracer transport uh, to the atmosphere from an uh, underground uh, activity. Uh, so, uh, at the nuclear ground explosion, basically, a dug up uh, uh, with a KVD, uh, which is filled with uh, rock fragments, uh, heated, uh, pressurized the gas, uh, and um, uh, filled with a uh, tracer, which then escapes uh, the KVD to the fracture network and reaches the ground surface where it can measure the uh, tracer flux. So our model uh, allows us to, uh, it allows us to simulate this uh, situation. And uh, now we are addressing uh, various uh, 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 cases uh, uh, to study the details of uh, various uh, uh, parameters. Uh, so, uh, uh, on the uh, trace of flux, uh, which uh, you can see, uh, uh, which you can measure on the ground the surface. So, we have uh, validated uh, our model on some uh, simple cases where we can have uh, an analytical solution. And uh, we present in uh, our poster uh, the results uh, that we have for different uh, pressure. Uh, pressures inside the cavity, different uh, cavity volumes, and uh, at the end uh, we started uh, the simulations uh, for the case where the gas inside the cavity is represented uh, by the water vapor, uh, which uh, escapes uh, and is uh, condensed as a uh, water which modifies significantly uh, the uh, picture that you observe and uh, this uh, alters significantly the transportation mode of, of the trace. So if you're interested in our poster, uh, you're welcome to visit uh, the correspondent page. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Sharing. Thank you very much, Alexei, for this uh, interesting presentation. The next uh, speaker on my list, we now go to the more uh, radionuclide part of the session. So the next speaker on my list is uh, Brian Bilbrath. I'm sure he joins us already. It's very early in the US, actually. So it looks like he is not there. So the next speaker is my colleague, Shenyung Yoon. Uh, good morning, Shenyung, the floor is yours. Good morning. I think I have an issue with sharing. Uh, I, I can just speak. As you prefer. Okay. Um... So morning, uh, my name is Song Yong Yoon and uh, my colleagues and I studied the effect of 2020 Chernobyl explosion zone wildfires on the IMS radionuclide stations network. So this study consists of three parts. Uh, first, we investigated the number of cesium 137 detections and its activity concentrations. And we found that the number of detections as well as uh, their activity concentrations increased right after the wildfires. And second, we derived cesium to potassium ratios for, station, uh, for stations under investigation. Uh, we used a simple linear regression analysis with the least squares method for fitting. So along with the atmospheric transport modeling, the cesium to potassium ratios proved that several samples were affected by the wildfires, which were shown as outliers in cesium to potassium plots. And third, we investigated the cesium level three and four discrimination threshold. This, uh, this threshold is used to decide whether a detection is usual or unusual. And at a couple of stations, the threshold showed that the effect of the wildfires lasted for one year. 
So please have a look at uh, the poster. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to hear them through this platform or my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shenyu, for this nice introduction of your uh, poster. I just see that uh, Brian Milbras just joined us a few minutes ago. So good morning or maybe good night, uh, Brian. Uh, the floor is yours if you are ready to uh, introduce your poster for two minutes. Thank you. Okay, looks like uh, Brian didn't take the floor. I will come back to Brian in, in a few minutes then. Um, and I will go to the next uh, speakers from Italy. Giuseppe Ottaviano, Rosanna Guali, and Angelica Cioca. You all three have two posters. So I will give the floor to all three of you for the introduction of the two different posters. So Giuseppe, the floor is yours and please feel to share it with your colleagues as needed. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you very well and we Hello. can even see you. Good morning, good morning. Okay. Um, the next, um, the speaker for the next uh, poster will be uh, my thesis student, Angelica Ciocca. And um, let's, uh, please, let's give, uh, the, let's give her the floor. Good morning. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well and see you also. Okay. And um, uh, well, uh, the parametric study of the radio xenon data distribution misure that the noble gas station of the international monitoring system of the CTTO is about uh, xenon 133 measurement of the USX 75 station in Virginia. In this study, the abnormal limit is calculated on the last 375 available observation, and it is based on the median, a more robust statistical index than the mean, and on the first and third quartiles. We have uh, um, co uh, compared the IDC method based on the interquartile filter method with the statistical process control tool, the control chart. The control chart is a graphical representation of a sequence of statistical tests carried out at regular time interval to verify if the phenomenon is in a statistical control. In this case, we have used the two control charts. The control chart for individual units sensitive to large variation from the mean. It uses the moving range as the basis for estimating the phenomenon variability and the EWMA control chart uh, to detect uh, a small displacement. Uh, it is typically used uh, with the individual observation. A good way to improve the sensitivity of the control procedure is to combine the two control charts in addition to the method used by the EDC. The analysis of the USX 75 EMS session came from the Bagler degree, degree thesis by Claudia Sanguini. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angelica, for this very nice uh, approach. Okay. Uh, and introduction um, of the poster, Giuseppe. I think you have another poster, and maybe you want to take the floor, yeah. or maybe um, okay. Rosanna. The next. Yes. Um, unfortunately, Rosanna is not online today, but uh, I can hear her a pre-recorded version of the poster. If you if you agree. As long as it's two minutes, I fully agree. Thank you. Yes, of course, two minutes. Don't worry. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Just a few seconds, please. Yes, sure. Opening now.
Okay, I am going to share. You say, but we don't hear anything. There is no sound for us. Giuseppe, can you hear me? Because there is no sound. We don't hear anything. Yes, they can hear. What, what, okay, what's the problem? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't hear you, actually. Of course, because Rosanna is speaking. No, no, we have no sound from Rosanna. No? But no. can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. We can see, uh, yeah, yeah, we can see the screen, the presentation, but there is no sound. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. No worries. Uh, honestly, I don't know how what to do in this case. Okay. No. speaking, I can hear her her voice, but uh, I don't Maybe... know how to. No, no worries, uh, Giuseppe. That's not a, a problem. That's part of the live streaming. Maybe you want to explain in few words uh, Hosanna's posters? Yes, of course. Why not? Okay, the, um, um, the, aim of the, or the aim of this poster is to apply um, a non-parametric um, statistical algorithm um, to the um, Xenon 133 uh, data distribution at um, the, um, one of the 25 noble gas IMS stations. Um, the algorithm is a, a, a new algorithm called the recursive segmentation and permutation. And um, the, um, this uh, new algorithm allows to, uh, um, to investigate the data distribution of the, of the station uh, without uh, a priori knowledge of the uh, data distribution. And um, this algorithm allows to uh, identify uh, significant shifts in not only the uh, phenomenon. Uh, so you um, you can see here uh, this graph. In this graph, uh, we can see um, the abnormal limit, the, the red line, and uh, the um, the raw data blue line, and the green line is the um, changes in the mean value and variability identified by this new algorithm. And the most significant, uh, um, the main result is that uh, there is a, a very good agreement between the um, uh, shift changes uh, uh, identified by this new algorithm with the changes with the, uh, the anomalous values identified using the interquartile filter, um, which is based on the harmonic normal limit. Uh, okay, that's all. Come and see our posters. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe, for, for this introduction. For the next uh, speaker, let's avoid sharing videos because apparently it's not that easy to do. Uh, yes. so we tried, but it didn't work very well. Um, I will go then to the next uh, speaker now, Sweden, Matthias Aldener, and I think that Matthias is with us this morning. So good morning, Matthias. The floor is yours. Matthias, can you hear us? Matthias Aldener, can you hear me? Okay, he is there, but not answering. Yes, he is unmuted now. Matthias?
Okay, Matthias, I will come back to you in two minutes um, and I will skip now to the next uh, speaker, Mr. Matthias Auer. So good morning, Matthias. Good morning, if can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well and I can see you. The floor is yours, thank you. Okay. You see my presentation? Yes, if you can just put it in presentation. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay, so this is a poster on the STAX project. STAX stands for Source Term Analysis of Xenon. And there have been a few presentations yesterday and already in the posters today where this was project was referred to. So STAX is an experimental network to um, detect emissions from medical isotope production facilities, and the measurements are done right at the stack. And the idea is basically that the data can be used then to better characterize the and understand the, the detected measurement at the IMS stations, for example, by simulating expected concentrations at IMS stations. Uh, so to estimate the impact of ISO production facilities on, on IMS stations. So this poster focuses um, not, some, not on the data itself. Um, there are the presentations. There are presentations on that and other, other authors. This poster focuses on the data processing and analysis infrastructure. So it shows how the data are being processed and how they're analyzed. And there is a web-based interface that is available to authorized users where the data can be viewed. And there are some examples on what data are available and how they can be viewed, can be viewed. for example, there is on this web page, there is an interface to view emission data time series that you can see here on the left side, where you can see the activities emitted per time for, for xenon isotopes from the stack over the given period of time. Or alternatively, you can view the isotopic ratios um, that of the emissions. So there are various ways to view data and various data available, also as state of health data to monitor the operational status of the system. And this poster shows a summary of all the data processing and all the data that are available to the users. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this introduction of the STAX project, a uh, very interesting project, by the way. Um, the next speaker on my list is my colleague, Jana Meresova. Uh, I've seen that Jana is with us. Good morning, Jana. The floor is yours for the two minutes introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my presentation. I hope it works. Okay. And or will I go for full screen like this? Um, If you go at the bottom right. Yes. Like this. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my name is Jana Mereshva. I am a radionuclide analyst at CTBTO. And together with my colleagues, I prepared uh, for you the this poster, preliminary analysis results of ongoing temporary radio on background measurement campaign in Japan. So I'm sure most of you know that there are different civil sources of radioxenol, uh, and this can express the ability to detect nuclear explosions through noble gas measurements, which are important part of the IMS uh, network. Thorough in understanding and characterization of the atmospheric background of radioxenols is therefore crucial. Uh, two transportable noble gas sauna systems were installed in Honorobe and Mutsu in Japan and started operation in 2018 with the aim of characterization of the xenon background in this region. Uh, the sample measurement spectra are sent to IDC where they are reviewed and concentrations of the four CTBT relevant xenon isotopes are calculated. The data were compared also with the results from the IMS station in Takasaki, and these three uh, points form a, a temporary high density network. Methods of sampling, processing, and radioactivity measurement are so shortly described in this poster. Okay. 
um, basic statistic overview of the data sets for two transportable systems and Takasaki IMS station are presented in our poster with the focus on Xenon 133. Also, the time series of Xenon 133 are also presented. Uh, and uh, I have to I have a small remark that detections of other isotopes are pretty rare in all three uh, systems. Also, box and whisker plots show that the background profiles are very similar at all three locations. Uh, we present also four isotopes direct and Bayesian ratio plots. And uh, this graphic presentation of data enables us theoretically to distinguish nuclear explosion sources from civilian releases. This work is still in progress and further investigation of the data sets is planned, especially in regard, regard with the temporary high density network. Uh, this information about the transportable and noble gas systems if it is available to authorize users of state signatories on the CTBTO secure web portal. You can find the link in the presentation in the poster. And access to this information may also be requested by the scientific community. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jana, for the nice uh, introduction to this e-poster. I can see now that uh, Brian Milbras uh, joined us again. Um, Brian, the floor is yours. If you can uh, take the floor now, you have two minutes to introduce your e-poster. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, now that I know that PTS uh, organizes their posters in alphabetical order, I will uh, get a different title next time. But uh, the uh, talk is uh, Xena, uh, the Xenon en Environmental Nuclide Analysis at Hartlepool. So this is a collaboration of, uh, besides PNL, where I'm at, the Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK, uh, FOI in Sweden, and also uh, EDF Energy, the operators of the Hartley Pool nuclear reactor in uh, North England. Brian, sorry to interrupt. May I ask you to uh, put your presentation in presentation mode? It would be more convenient for us. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Great. So, Xena is a measurement campaign of uh, three different uh, radionuclide monitoring techniques uh, that we're going to be using at Hartley Pool in order to better understand radionuclide emissions from a nuclear power reactor and how those might affect. Uh, the international monitoring system. And the three techniques that we're going to use are a uh, stack monitor for radio xenon uh, that will give us a measurement right at the source, uh, standoff measurements for radio xenon several kilometers away after atmospheric transport uh, and dispersion. And the way that we're doing that is we're going to be using three of the new SONA Cube uh, radio xenon detector uh, and analyzer systems. And uh, thirdly, uh, we're going to make radionuclide measurements uh, of environmental samples taken at or near the power station and then uh, measured using uh, ultra low background facilities, both in the US and the United Kingdom. The measurement campaign has only just begun. We only have some initial uh, uh, samples from the environmental effort, uh, but we're gonna be running for a whole year. And if you uh, stop by my poster and go through all of the slides, uh, you'll learn more about what we're gonna measure. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, we will for sure stop by your poster. Um, I will go back uh, because I can see that Michael Fox also joined us in the meantime. So good morning, Michael. The floor is yours for the two minute introduction. So the, please take the floor. Morning. Good morning. Let me get this shared. Sorry, one moment. Sure. Hello, thanks for joining join me. My name is Michael Fox. I'm going to talk about the um, work we have going on at PNNL for the isopic transport variation as a function of geology. We want to look at what's the impact of geology, both on the initial formation of material, as well as how it transports as it moves through a distance. And so we're doing this with laboratory scale experiments at PNNL, looking at um, two different methods, either uh, generating particles that we can then measure. And so looking at that with non-radioactive surrogates where we make uh, phosphorescent particles that we can blow up in a exploding wire setup. And so if you um, come to our come to my poster, you'll see see an area where we put the wire, put the particles within and on a wire here, and then we can detonate those and see where the particles go. We also went through and looked at what was the impact of gas on, what was the movement of gas through materials, through geologic materials. Um, looking at soils, tufts, um, salts, clays, how fast, what, what are the me mechanical properties like uh, heat, of, heat absorption and uh, enth the diffusion coefficient, partition coefficient, want to map out those different properties. So if you come to my poster, you'll see how those compare for the different materials and um, what the impact is on the large transport for the, the different models like uh, um, like STOMP or different subsurface transport models, how those can be leveraged within the community. So if you can come to my poster, then I'll give you a little bit more detail on, on how these are used. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I would be happy to get more details uh, and discussing your poster later. I will, uh, I just see also that Prince Amoa from Ghana, I think, just joined us a few minutes ago. So I would like to come back to this uh, presentation. So Prince Amoa, if you can uh, hear me, the floor is yours for the two minutes introduction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning from Ghana. I would Good. share my slides and then short one. Please, can you see? It's coming. Okay. Now we can see your presentation. Okay. Okay. You. So my presentation is on the comparative study of the transient, comparative study of the transient and steady state thermohydraulic analysis of the low and rich uranium core of the Ghana Research Reactor One. Uh, the authors have been indicated there. Countries seeking a quick bomb or would be nuclear terrorists have eyes on poorly secured sites that contain significant quantities of high enriched uranium. And this material is a material of choice for terrorists and, and people who would want to proliferate strictly without testing their weapons. Therefore, so, sorry, to, may I interrupt you? May I ask you to go in presentation mode because I okay. don't really see your slide very well. Okay. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Okay. But it will be more convenient for everyone. Yes, please. A moment, please. Sure. Can press F5. Okay. 
It should work. Thank you. Yes, it works. Thank you. Okay, Always okay. yours. Yeah, so there has been a global concern that most HEU re research reactors be converted to LEU, the low enriched uranium, so that for high enriched uranium, the amount of uranium 235 is more than 20%, which does not, which is a weapon grade. And when terrorists or would be countries that want to still really proliferate, have access to such stockpiles of uranium could be used for nuclear bombs and other stuff. And so Ghana's research reactor by has been converted from high enriched uranium to a low enriched uranium. This work seeks to conduct a steady state and thermohydraulic analysis of the research reactor to show whether having converted from high enriched uranium, does it still support and is it still inherently safe to run the reactor? This is the longitudinal, longitudinal section of the Gawan core and then the floor lattice arrangement after the core conversion. And the core, com the core components of the core is presented here. Now the current enrichment of the Gawan core is 13%, around 13%. And the cladding is now zinc alloy for, or zirconium alloy. Initially it used to be aluminum, but now it's zirconium alloy and also the Moderator still is water, the coolant is still water, but then the reactor power has been able to change, the reactor power has been able to change, having converted from LEU to HEU to LEU to 34 kilowatts. Some of the results is showed here. This is the comparison of the power profile showed on the right. The reactor from the experimental result and then the analytical results that were conducted have been also indicated. So I would urge as many of us that can pass by to see the poster and then also ask further questions. There are further details which are in the poster and any question that is posted, I'll be glad to attend to. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very good introduction to, you, to your e-poster. Um, the next speaker is Mr. Gato Suai Riono. Uh, Good afternoon, Gato. I see that you have raised your hand, so the floor is yours now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please uh, yes, share, your... you share my presentation? Yes. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you can see my presentation. Yes, we can see your presentation. So you have two minutes for the introduction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Gatot Suaryono from Indonesia. I will present about development of new method for measuring iodine-131 concentration by using direct and direct methods in radioisotope production stack and environment outdoor. <clears throat> Um, Gato, sorry, uh, it's a video, but again, we can see the slides, but oh, we cannot video. anything. So I would prefer if you can introduce your oh, poster. Sorry, video. Yeah. Speaking. No worries, no worries. Uh, all is all is fine. Um, but it's better if you can introduce your poster uh, by yourself and continue speaking uh, with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry, I will. Uh, a change to my presentation about I will. Oh, difficulties. Okay, Gato, no problem. Um, I will uh, go to the next uh, speaker so you have time to find your presentation, and uh, so you will be ready in uh, in a few minutes. Is this fine with you? Okay, I, I will speak uh, about my presentation. Uh, <clears throat> my research about uh, a new method because a radiation production facility in Serpong has produced and processed Uden 131, which can be dispersed to residential area 
and the environment around Serpong in Indonesia. Measurement of air release dispersion yodine 131 using odd at all a tool is not function and only a charcoal filter is function in the stack uh, the isoto production facility measurement of the yodine 131 dispersion dispersion to the environment around uh, in serpong has not been carried out therefore is net uh, it is necessary to develop a new method of measuring the release yodine 131 concentration in the stack combined with equipment from CTPTO and Yodain 131 measurement in the especially on air using portable in situ with a sodium Yodain NTL detector were carried out in the environment and using the latent lanthanum bromide detector in the stack. Indirect measurement using charcoal filter and vacuum pump were carried out in the stack and outdoor. The newly development UDN 131 discharge measurement method can be used uh, to replace the UDN 131 analog method because the new measuring system can be operated rapidly and continuously. A concentration UDN 131 during rain and high humidity, humidity tends to increase well the present of um, like reduce correction of your then 131 thank you thank you very much okay, Kato, you. for your for the introduction of your uh, e poster very good uh, developments in indonesia Next uh, speakers are from Argentina, Federico Balis and Eduardo Luis Nassif. As far as I understand, uh, Federico is going to present uh, the e-poster, to introduce the e-poster. So, Federico, good morning. The floor is yours. Good morning. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I won't be able to, to share my screen because I am using my mobile phone for streaming. But I can uh, speak about the our e-poster. Um, well, we, we present uh, the current status of the stack effluent monitor that we have manufactured at Imbab headquarters. Uh, for the U.S. laboratory PNN in the framework of Stax uh, project. So uh, we present uh, our our monitor that uh, is based on the um, uh, on, on the characteristic of, of 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 the release of the medical isotope production facilities. Uh, it is a, a quite specific challenge because the characteristic of some of, of these uh, plants with low dilution uh, emission facilities. Um, so we designed this uh, monitor with some specific uh, features that we, we we try to present in this in, in this poster. And also, we we will see in the poster uh, some nice pictures of the of, of the system of the of the hardware. Um, and well, we, we had the, the aim to present uh, uh, here in this conference some of uh, measures uh, in the real uh, uh, environment in the in, in the real plant uh, because we we. We try to to deliver the system to the uh, uh, Centro Atomico Ezeiza in in Buenos Aires, where there is a medical isotope uh, production facility. But because some restrictions about the the, um, the COVID pandemic, we could not uh, deliver yet. Uh, but we we will do in the in, in the near future. So um, in the meantime, we we did some uh, simulations with a, a real uh, inventory 
in order to uh, to see how, how how is the performance of our system. So uh, this is uh, what we present in our in our e poster. Thank you very much, Federico, for this uh, very good introduction. The next speaker, okay. thank you very much. Um, the next speaker who is with us is Doris Rashid Shaif. Saif, excuse me. So, Doris, if you can hear us, you can unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, and we can even see you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Doris Safe from United Republic of Tanzania. Um, our presentation is about the spatial and temporal variation of anthropogenic radionuclides, cesium 164 and cesium 167 in ground level air samples by IME stations located in the African continent. So, in our presentation, what we did is um, to, to, to show uh, spatial and temporal variation of this radionuclide. For that case, spatial and temporal based analysis was performed to scan various patterns of this radionuclide. Also, uh, correlation analysis was also performed to, 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 to investigate the effect of meteorological parameters and radionuclide concentration. So you can see more in our poster. The results are there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction of your um, poster. So my colleague Martin Kalinowski should uh, join us in a few minutes. He's actually still convening a session in parallel. Um, in the meantime, I would like to give the floor to Matthias Aldener. Uh, Matthias is with us. So Matthias, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. And the floor is yours. Matthias, good morning. I see now that you are unmuted, but we don't hear anything for you and we don't see you. Matthias, um, I have a notification saying that uh, the video uh, is not currently available, but can you hear me? Maybe you should stop your video. Okay, Matthias, sorry, uh, I still have this notification uh, saying that the video is not currently available. Please have a look at your settings. I just see that uh, Petra Seibert just uh, joined us a few minutes ago. So I will give the floor to Petra in a few seconds. Uh, Matthias, I will come back to you right uh, after. So good morning, Petra. Uh, just see that you are joining us. The floor is yours for the few minutes. For yeah. The uh, introduction. Thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you very well. Ah, that is good. I am very sorry. I was in the wrong uh, meeting before. <laughs> okay, I will try to share my preview uh, of the poster. Um, so... Okay, do you see it? Yes, yes, we see it. Maybe you can put it in presentation mode so you have the full. I will try. Yeah. Thank you, Petra. Yeah, so hello, everybody. 
and uh, my poster is directed at those people who are interested uh, in using our FlexPart atmospheric transport model uh, or um, who already do use it but maybe uh, are not so certain about uh, how to use uh, it exactly um, because there are so many options and ways uh, to set up simulations. So I thought it could be useful if I put together some uh, explanations and recommendations, uh, including those that came out from the ATM challenges. Uh, so I invite you to study that. And if you have any questions, uh, you are always welcome to contact me, not only during our conference, but you can email me anytime and uh, I will try to uh, work out if you, uh, with you if you have any problem or also receive any feedback as I'm also uh, uh, one of the developers of the model. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Petra, for this introduction of your e-poster. Um, I will come back now to Matthias Aldener. Matthias, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Matthias, you are still muted. So, yes, my colleague just sent you a request for unmuting you. Looks like we have, we are facing some technical issues with Matthias. Matthias, you are now, no, you are still muted actually. No, it's moving a bit. So, Matthias, um, please use the chat with my colleague, Ms. Hak. She's uh, the technical person for this session. She will try to solve it, uh, to solve the issue with you. But I'm not forgetting you. Uh, as uh, I, we understand that you hear us, but you get no sound in Webex. So maybe it helps my colleague. In the meantime, I see that Martin, my colleague Martin Kalinowski, just uh, joined. Uh, after finishing convening his session. So I will give him the floor. And then Matthias, I will come to you uh, right after Martin for another trial. So Martin, good morning. The floor is yours for the introduction of your poster. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And um, um, I can share my screen. So I'm introducing the post on global radio xenon emission inventory for 2014 um, by normal operational releases from nuclear power plants and medical isotope production uh, facilities. So this is basically a summary of um, long work done to collect uh, uh, these information uh, using best information, best informa available information, including reports from the facilities and instead of using a generic year, um, this is as much as possible specific for 2014, only if data are not available, then these are replaced by generic releases uh, for a date. And um, since all these data are published already, um, this uh, presentation focuses on the lessons learned from these data and published all from public available sources. The peer-reviewed uh, papers are out for uh, on the nuclear power plant releases 2014, nuclear research reactor releases 2014. And uh, then we look into lessons learned from this and also uh, what sources may be missing. So there will be a few thoughts about spallation neutron sources, which is an activation source, not a fission source. And therefore, the isotopic ratios are uh, specifically different. Um, I, I think I didn't take two minutes, but that's fine. Um, uh, you can join me at this poster. And um, oh yes, one more thing I wanted to say is this is the data set that was used for 
the two, for the 2019 uh, ATM challenge, the third ATM challenge, and the update of this as presented here will be used for the intercomparison exercise for the, uh, uh, the the comparison of tools for estimating uh, uh, IMS uh, observations based on known sources. Uh, in 2014, and, and, and metrics will be applied on this to uh, uh, distinguish uh, known sources from uh, hypothetical nuclear test releases, and we are creating a data set of nuclear test releases for this um, uh, that will be added on the IMS observations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this very good introduction of the e-poster. I will now go back to Matthias Aldener. Uh, I think, Matthias, <laughs> that my colleague and you solved the problem. So good morning, Matthias. The floor is yours now. I'm waiting a little bit to leave. Good morning, Jonathan. Do you hear me? Matthias. Good morning, Matthias. Yes, we can hear you now. And we can even see you now. Good. I had to switch to the app. <laughs> but finally. Yeah, I understood, I understood that from the, the WebEx application. So thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, I'll try to get the presentation up. I'm just waiting for the presentation too. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Maybe you can put it in presentation mode so we have the full screen. Well, no, so, no, yes, perfect, perfect. So Thank we you. have a very much delay. I had to turn off the other sound. So good morning, finally. So I have two posters. I will start with the one that we looked at the background of uh, the study of the background, the radio xenon at IMS station in Sweden. It is, a, is important to understand the radio xenon background at the stations in the IMS network. It improves the capacity to discriminate between civilian sources and releases from nuclear explosions. Here you can see the wind directions uh, for detections of the four CN isotopes. CN133 is detected in more than half of the samples. And you can see more of the details in the poster. Um, when we look at detections of all four isotopes, the number of detections increases dramatically for the more sensitive SANA3 system, which is actually co-located with our IMS system for a few years. We get 82 detections in three years with the SANA-3 as compared to four detections in eight years for the SANA-2 system. So we really look forward to getting a SANA-3 system in the network, which will really improve the verification. So with that, just please look at the poster for more information. So Jonathan, I guess I'll just go for the next poster. Is that Sorry. okay? Yes, yes, please. This is perfectly okay. Oh, okay. So. In the second poster, we present measurements of the natural occurring background of radio xenon and radio argon in so subsol gas measured in Sweden. This work is a joint collaboration between FOI and the University of Bern. And uh, the reason we do this is so that radio detection of radioactive novel gas in the subsoil is an important part of an on-site inspection. It is important to have knowledge of the natural occurring background of these isotopes to discriminate from a nuclear underground explosion. The poster, as you can see, describes collection of salt gas as well as the results from the measurements in Sweden. And you see some of the results here. I'll switch to the next slide. And here you see the results for argon-37 and C-133. This is the only c isotopes we detected, but these two isotopes are detected in all the samples we analyzed for this site. And 
if you want to see the details, please visit the poster or try to find me on this platform. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for the very good introduction of these uh, two posters, and it was very good to have you finally. I will go back to my colleague Martin Kalinowski because he would like to uh, present another poster. So, Martin, the floor is yours uh, again. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, let me share my screen. This is a poster on Radio Xeno 135 observations at IMS Mobile Gas stations and uh, this is an issue that is has long been um, in question the, there are sometimes xenon 135 observations alone no other radio xenon observed which is very strange and uh, often xenon 135 ratio to xenon 133 is quite high higher than expected from fission unless it's a very fresh release and that's unlikely actually so um the fact is that the isotopic ratios are different for fission and for activation and xen135 is the lead nuclide together with xen131m for activation and xen133 is very low compared to these isotopes for activation whereas for fission xen133 is the lead nuclide so we have to look for an activation source um, and we did this for many of these detections in japan um, and we test the hypothesis that the uh, spallation neutron source in uh, Japan called, uh, or the facility is called J-Park, where this is located, this spallation neutron source. We test the hypothesis that that is the possible explanation of least, uh, at least of some of the radio xenon observations that we have at the Takasaki IMS station. And um, yeah, uh, the answer is in the poster. So please take a look at the poster and uh, perhaps we meet later for a discussion there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Sorry, I was a little bit fast on uh, taking the flow back. I would like to go to uh, last call for Syed Mikhaimer, maybe that he joins us and wants to take the floor to introduce his poster. If not, Carlos Eduardo Bonfim from Brazil. Alexander, Alexander Hillen is he with us? No, and then Matthew Goodwin. is not with us. So, um, is there any additional order not on my list willing to take the floor for a two minutes presentation or maybe an additional poster that you, you have? If yes, please let me know now. Okay, then I think it's time to close. So thank you very much for this, for your active um, participation in this uh, round table. I just got a note from 307 by Doris Safe, but uh, for Martin, but Martin, this poster has been presented by Doris. Uh, from the chat, sorry, uh, from the chat, I see that Jonathan Burnett told me that he would be happy to take the floor for an introduction of his e-poster. We still have time, so Jonathan, I think the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope everybody can see my screen. My name's Jonathan Burnett. Um, I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, my poster is titled Ultra Sensitive Gamma Spectrometry Measurements of Environmental Samples from the Hartlepool Nuclear Power Station. Um, it's a collaboration between PNNL, also EDF Energy, and the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment. 
The work is being undertaken as part of the Xena um, Environmental Nuclide Analysis Collaboration, which um, my colleague um, Brian Milbrath presented on earlier. The goal is to better understand how the emissions from a nuclear reactor might impact the IMS, and it's part of a two-year measurement campaign. We're currently in the first year. Just as a quick summary, the, um, the Hartlepool reactor is an advanced gas reactor, started operations in 1983 in the UK, generates about 2% of the UK's electricity. We're receiving samples from a number of positions in the reactor, mostly air filter samples, um, but also um, uh, biota samples later on in, in the campaign. These samples are being measured at the underground laboratory at PNNL, um, and also at the UK's um, Bulgari Mine Facility, where there's very sensitive gamma spectroscopy systems. We're looking for a range of different radionuclides. There's a picture of the, um, the Argo system, the PNNL system, and also the AWE system. We're looking for a range of CTBT relevant radionuclides, of the 84 radionuclides. So far, we've detected um, a, a range of fusion activation products, for example, cesium, sil silver isotopes. Um, activation products such as manganese 54. And as we move forward on this campaign, we'll aim to identify a radionuclide fingerprint for this type of reactor and how it can impact the IMS. We've also done radio xenon uh, measurements and simulations as well of the isotopics. Um, Martin, you'll hopefully be interested in this. We can see how, how the ratios differ from, from what we might um, expect. Um, there we go. My talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this nice introduction. Um, I just would like to answer a comment that we got through the chat from Said uh, Mekheimer. He says that he has problem with the connection. He's sorry for that. Um, so everybody, everybody knows. Uh, sorry to hear that. Well, to read that, uh, Said. But I'm sure that your poster will be visited. So I think it's uh, time to close the session. I would like to thank you very much for your active participation in this uh, roundtable. Again, I would like to encourage you all to visit the e-posters available on the SNT 2021 event platform, watch the videos there and engage uh, discussions with uh, authors. Last but not least, I would like to thank the technical team for the great and efficient support that they are providing and that they have provided uh, today in solving a uh, few issues and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you.